As the idling boat slowly drifted further from the launch, my cousin Tom and his wife Phoebe argued about whether or not their six-month-old baby should be wearing his life jacket. I busied myself looking out at the evergreens lining the coast, pretending I couldn't hear them and trying to stay out of it. My then-boyfriend James climbed into the passenger seat, shook the blonde curls out of his eyes and cracked a beer, singling the official beginning of the fun. I zipped up my coat to ward off the ocean breeze, giving myself a mental pep talk about how great this trip was going to be. It had been months since I'd had any real quality time with James, and while cramming four adults and a baby into a smallish boat during winter to freeze our asses off just fishing for two days really wasn't a picture-perfect weekend, it would even a little time to ourselves would make it all worth it. Not too long before, my life had felt like it was inspired by a Hallmark movie. A girl from Big City visits her mom's tiny rural hometown, <laughs> meets a sweet down-to-earth blue-eyed boy who works with his trucks, uh, works with his hands and drives a truck. <laughs> they spend the summer talking late into the night, lying in a field, counting shooting stars under the light pollution-free sky, sneaking away from parties to be alone together, giggling as they held hands and jumped naked into the lake. They shared a dream of selling everything and moving into a VW van. But at the end of the summer, she had to go back to college. And against the odds, despite the distance, they made it work. The following year, she graduated and decided to move there to start a new life with them. And they all lived. Well, as it turns out, there's a, <laughs> there's a good reason movies end when the couples get together. Everything that comes next is boring as fuck. By age 22, my life consisted of sitting alone in our 450-square-foot apartment after work, waiting to hear back from my now months unemployed boyfriend on whether or not he was going to come home for dinner, or if he was going to come home at all, if we can still have a date night sometime that week. Okay, not that week. Maybe the one after? Seated beside a pile of unfinished crafts, I'd light up a joint and look lustfully at googled images of the tiled buildings and cobblestone streets of Portugal, of vibrant landscapes framed by the snowy peaks of the Swiss Alps, picturing us there together and convincing myself that an adventurous break from the routine would be the key to dragging us out of the rut that we were in. At least, that's what I was doing when I got the text from Phoebe asking if we wanted to go out on their boat, and my glazed eyes lit up with hope that some fun was on the horizon. That I'd get to do something to remind myself that I was 22, and there were still signs of life outside of work in this apartment. This weekend was going to be great. I was sure of it. The boat rocked as James grabbed another beer from the cooler and handed it to me. Cheers, he said, clinking his can to mine. Although it was only 10 a.m. and I had no interest in drinking it, I appreciated the gesture, so I planted a kiss on his cheek and cracked it open. It's the little things, after all. Phoebe and Tom finally stopped arguing. The baby wailed as they shoved his chubby little arms through the life jacket and buckled it. Tom hopped in the driver's seat, and we were on our way. No more than five minutes later, there was a rough bump and a loud noise. But it wasn't a normal sound of a boat slapping the water. It sort of sounded like metal ripping. <laughs> but what do I know about boats? We kept cruising along, and nobody thought anything of it. For a few minutes, I forgot about the noise and just took in the beautiful views of the British Columbia coastline, appreciating the blue sky that had decided to grace us on that chilly day, letting the ocean air sting my cheeks and tangle my hair. Ah, oh, delightful. And then my eyes were drawn to movement inside the boat. A waterfall had formed between the captain and passenger seats, pouring in from the berth, the, the cabin, the, the place where the little bit, the front of the boat, the, the front. <laughs> At first I thought, uh-oh, the gallon of drinking water we packed sprung a leak. And then I thought, sheesh, this seems like a lot more than one gal. Oh shit, no, we're sinking. I was about to say something to alert the guys, but Phoebe beat me to it. She screamed. No words, just the fear for her life, escaping her body in the loudest, shrillest way possible. This was not a completely overdramatic response, given the circumstances. We were in a fairly small boat in the ocean in the middle of winter in Canada, sinking in the ocean with a baby in the ocean. <laughs> James and Tom stared at her, confused. 
I pointed at the waterfall, which was now flowing in an increased volume and forming a pool. Jumping into action, Tom pushed down the, uh, the hand-operated gas pedal and, uh, and picked up our speed. James tightened his grip on his beer and said, uh, fuck. Um, <laughs> Phoebe shoved her baby into my lap and shouted, hold my baby, I can't swim, and continued to scream. So I wrapped one arm tightly around the baby as James wrapped a second hand around his beer. I desperately, I desperately wanted Phoebe to stop screaming. So I covered her eyes with the other hand and said, just uh, don't look. My own eyes widened as I tapped my shoes in the inch and a half of water my feet were now in. Maybe we all should have worn the life jackets? My heart rate quickening, I scanned the water around us to come up with a plan. I had seen Titanic a time or two, so I knew if I, could, if I could just swim the baby over to something he could float on, he could avoid freezing to death, and I could pull a Jack Dawson just floating there like a hero, holding his tiny baby hands, waiting for help to arrive. My lips probably all crusty and turning blue, and maybe I could teach him how to blow a whistle sometime in the next minute or so before this vessel reaches the bottom of the sea so we could call for help. But as I braced myself to succumb to the painfully cold waters and valiantly save this baby, I looked over at James, who hadn't made any moves to, say, grab life jackets for the rest of us, but had somehow acquired a koozie for his beer, <laughs> and was now looking around aimlessly, clearly unsure of what to do with his hands, before just grabbing his cell phone off the dashboard and slipping it into his pocket. Because Voting 101 tells us it's important to secure your technology and alcohol when in a losing battle with the sea. <laughs> and by some miracle, Tom steered us into a marina that seemed to appear out of nowhere, where we were able to stay afloat just long enough to drive up onto the boat ramp. The engine turned off. The four of us exhaled. The baby sat silently, still in my lap, looking back and forth between us all, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. James slurped his beer. And Phoebe began to laugh. <laughs> I thought we were going to die. <laughs> After pumping the knee-deep water out of the boat, we managed to get all of our belongings out without any damage to anything. My uncle came with the boat trailer and picked us up. Lo and behold, there was a two-inch wide, four-inch long rip in the bottom of the boat, or on the, the helm's underbelly, I think they call it. Um, I... <laughs> I don't know much about boats, but I did understand that the hull was probably what impacted our buoyancy back there. <laughs> Tom suggested that since we were already packed, we may as well hop in the car and go camping. So baby's first <laughs> boat ride became baby's first shipwreck between baby's first camping trip. Yay. <laughs> Although camping in the cold sounded slightly worse than fishing, at least we were alive and trying to make the most of our weekend. There was still a chance to get some quality time with James. Perhaps we could snuggle under a blanket after everyone went to bed and have one of those late night heart to heart talks we used to have under the stars. It would be nice. And it was, we cooked a nice dinner and played nicely with the baby and drank some nice beers and ate some nice s'mores and we all got along nicely. We reminisced about the day's wild events around the fire, how lucky we were that if we were going to hit along, it was timed so nicely for us to make it into that marina on time. And then everyone was tucked nicely into bed by 8 p.m. James rolled over with his back to me, snoring immediately. I, could have, I should have been tired from the adrenaline crash, but I wasn't. I lay awake, staring at the ceiling of the tent, my mind racing, my heart pounding, and my stomach twisting into anxious knots. I'd been begging for an adventure, craving company, and a weekend out of the house. I got even more excitement than I was asking for and made it out alive, yet I felt deeply disappointed. I pulled the covers up under my chin and pictured James during the chaos earlier, sitting there sipping beer, looking lost, doing nothing while I did everything I could to make things as okay as they could be given the situation we were in. That was his pattern, though. <laughs> Doing nothing to find his next job, spending his time two hours away at his parents' house, making metal art sculptures in their woodshed and claiming this was his new career path, while doing nothing to actually sell his pieces. Doing nothing night after night as I sat alone in our apartment with tears in my eyes, texting him my pleas to come home, trying to make some plans with him, expressing my loneliness, asking him to show me he gave a shit. Nothing. 
As the disappointment bubbled into anger, suddenly his spontaneous go-with-the-flow approach to life that I once thought was free-spirited and charming now appeared aloof and unreliable. His it'll-all-work-out optimism looked a lot more like a refusal to take responsibility for anything. For the past several years, he had been content to stay in the passenger seat, sipping his beer and waiting to see how life played out, whereas I had been suspended in that moment right before we began to take on water, pretending I hadn't heard any alarming noises, trying so hard to have a good time at ignoring the reality that we were sinking. It was time to wash the poop off the deck and head leeward towards the starship and whatever other nautical theme metaphors illustrate that I was ready to admit nothing was going to change unless I changed it. I couldn't understand why we had drifted so far from where we started in our relationship. When had we let the monotony of life rip a hole in our, our helms underbelly? But I knew it was time to face the reality that he wasn't going to help me fix it. Lying there shivering in that tent, I conjured a plan that, for the first time in years, didn't involve rowing with the anchor down, moored at the portside pier with the bilge in the stern beam, you know? (laughs) I decided I'd move to my best friend's city so that life wouldn't be so lonely. I'd crash on her couch and apply for jobs when I got there. I'd call her tomorrow and she'd be over the moon about the plan. I'd tell James on Monday. It wouldn't be easy. I'd shed some tears and I'd do my best to reassure him that I still cared for him. And it didn't matter that I said any of this because it wasn't actually a Hallmark movie and he didn't chase me through any airports to shave our relationship. I finally let it go and James did nothing. Another vamp first timer, Chelsea Glazer.